Okay, uh, good evening students. Uh, let me introduce myself since you have not seen me before. My name is Dr. Ria. Uh, I just joined one year before as a senior lecturer in your college. And um, I know you're new to, uh, new to this department and uh, but we cannot meet uh, personally. But I hope these classes will at least, you know, um, give you some interest. Look, I know the, the chapters are a little, this especially Jinjava is a little bit of a dry chapter, but very difficult to communicate by online. But we'll do our best, okay? So what I know is that Jenny Ma'am has almost finished a, a part of it, a part, uh, part of the Jinjava, and then rest of it is left. So let, let me just summarize what has been taken for you. So we can, can we start with the definition of gingerba? What is gingerba? It is the part of the oral mucosa, which covers the alveolar processes of the jaws and will surround the neck of the teeth. So that is the main function of gingerba. And uh, you have already uh, started with macroscopic features. Gingerba has got macroscopic features and it has got microscopic features. Now, as Dr. Jenny has already mentioned, what are the macroscopic features or what are the parts of the gingiva? So it has got three parts. So we have the marginal gingiva or the free gingiva, the loose part of the gum, right? Second part will be the interdental gingiva that is between the two teeth, between a pair of teeth, the part, the gums, which is between them. And then finally, we have the attached gingiva. So these are the parts of the gingiva. And then, so this will come under your macroscopic feature. After that, you learn the functions of uh, functions and the importance of all these parts, right? And uh, then, ma'am has already covered, I think, starting of microscopic features. Uh, now, again, gingiva is made up of, it's composed of three parts again, okay? Uh, we have the gingival epithelium, then we have the epithelium connective tissue interface, and then we have the connective tissue. The connective tissue interface is the gap between the gingival epithelium and the connective tissue. So again, the gingival is composed of three parts, which is the gingival epithelium, the gingival epithelium interface, sorry, uh, uh, epithelium connective tissue interface, and then we have the connective tissue. And if I'm not wrong, ma'am has already covered the gingival epithelium as a whole. So we have left with the, uh, the rest two parts. Now, epithelium, again, ma'am has told you that the um, gingival epithelium is composed of oral epithelium, cellular, and junctional epithelium. And uh, junctional epithelium as such is an important part for this chapter, which is which can be asked as an essay question as well. So you need to know the importance of junctional epithelium, functions of junctional epithelium. And then uh, she's also covered the cells, okay? The, uh, the, the what do you say? The cells present in the gingival epithelium are namely, what is the principal cell type? We have the keratinocytes and then we have the non-keratinocytes, but 90% is made up of keratinocytes. And we have the non-keratinocytes, which are your Merkel cells, your melanocytes and your Langerhan cells. Now, so this much was your gingival epithelium. Now let's come to the connective tissue epithelium interface, or that is the area between the epithelium and the connective tissue. Now, what do you think this area has. Let's move. So epithelium connective tissue interface. Now this is composed of four elements. As you can see in the PPT, there are four elements in the epithelium connective tissue interface. One, we have the basal cell plasma membrane, which is a specialized attachment devices. Then we have the lamina lucida, which is electrolucent zone. Lamina densa, which is dense, electrodense. With, with a lot of type 4 collagen, and then we have the reticular layer, okay? Uh, this is basically where all the intercellular, um, you know, communication is going to happen, okay? So we have all these four elements in the epithelium connective tissue interface, which is the basal cell plasma membrane, which is a specialized, with specialized attachment devices, lamina lucida, lamina dense, and reticular layer. Now let's go in detail. And this interface has got various junctional complexes. Junction, see, as you reach the end of a road, we have a junction, right? So somewhat similar, 
the gingiva also has various junctional complexes. And this is where there's a lot of exchange of intercellular, uh, the communications and things that happen. So the various junctional complexes, right now what we're going to study are, we have three types of junctional complexes. So we have the tight or the occluding junctions. They are formed by the fusion of external leaflets of adjacent cell membrane. Then we have the adhesive junctions. So as the name suggests, adhesive meaning sticky. So it is cell to cell or it could be cell to metric. So there are connections between each cell membrane and there could be connection between the cell and the matrix. The matrix is your connective tissue, which is below, right? We have the gingival epithelium, epithelium connective tissue interface and the connective tissue. So there are, uh, we have the tight occluding junctions. Then we have the adhesive, adhesive junctions, which are between the cell amongst the cell and then we have from cell to the connective tissue and then finally we have the communicating gap junctions and this community gap, communicating gap junctions means they bridge both the adjacent membrane uh, and the intercellular space so there is a connection between the membrane and the connect, connective tissue as such okay so these are the various junctional complexes now amongst them, so which is already mentioned, we have already said tight and occluding junctions, we have the adhesive and the communicating. Now cell to cell. So what are the junctions or what are those uh, elements which are present in the cell to cell between the membrane? So that is called zonula adherence or desmosomes, which are the most common. Okay, so most commonly they're called desmosomes. Now what are they made up of? They consist of two attachment plaque one from each cell, separated by an interval of approximately 30 nanometers. So this is how they're going to bridge it. They're going to make a bridge uh, between the two cells. So they have got two attachment plaques, and these are coming out from each cell membrane and at a distance of, they have an interval of approximately 30 nanometers. So desmosomes are the adhesive junctions, or they are connections between cell to cell. Remember that. Now, cell to matrix. So, where is the connection between the cell to the connective tissue? They are called focal adhesions. They are focal adhesion type, and that is hemidesmosomes. So, don't get confused between desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. Hemidesmosomes are your cell to matrix connection. There is a connection between the cell membrane to the connective tissue, whereas desmosomes are cell to cell between two membranes. They are made up of two attachment plugs coming from each cell at an interval of 30 nanometers, okay? Then now, as I, uh, what we mentioned before, communicating gap junctions. So they have intercellular, they're called channels, or they are like pipes, which can bridge the adjacent membrane and the intercellular space. So it's not just the membrane to membrane or membrane to connective tissue. They're connecting the membrane to the intercellular space, okay? They're connecting the membrane and the intercellular space or the connective tissue. And they are the specific sites of signal transduction. So where this is where the intercellular communication happens. Okay. So that was what was made up of, uh, that is your interface. So interface, you just need to remember, they have four elements and they have some various junction complexes. And they are the tight occluding junctions or you have the uh, adhesive junctions, which uh, those are between cell to cell or cell to matrix. And then we have the communicating gap junctions. Cell to cell, remember, they're desmosomes, and cell to matrix are hemidesmosomes. You need to know their basic structure. And communicating junctions are that are connecting the adjacent membrane, the channels or pipes which are connecting the adjacent membrane to the connective tissue. Okay, that's it. Now coming to the third part of the gingiva. So we finished with gingival epithelium. We finished with the epithelium connective tissue interface. Now coming to connective tissue as a whole. Now, what is lamina propria? Okay, so this is beneath the epithelial integument resides the gingival connective tissue. So it is, the other name for gingival connective tissue is lamina propria. So it's also known as lamina propria. Okay, so that compartment or the gingival connective tissue is also referred to as a lamina propria. Connective tissue accounts for the major portion of the free gingival marginal gingiva. So we already mentioned the parts of gingiva. We know free gingiva or the marginal gingiva. Then we have interdental gingiva, attached gingiva. So now they're saying that the connective tissue is what is making the major portion of the marginal gingiva or the free gingiva, interdental gingiva and the attached gingiva. So major portion of these three parts of gingiva is 
by the connective tissue alone, including both facial and the oral aspects of these structures. Okay, so major portion of the free gingiva, interdental, and the attached gingiva is made up of the connective tissue, that is, both facial and oral aspects. The lamina propria or the connective tissue exhibits an exquisitely complex architecture which anticipates its function. So what do you think will be the, because it's making the major bulk of your gum, okay, major bulk, that is your, uh, it is giving, uh, it is, uh, you know, protect, it, it is basically a free gingiva, the interdental and the uh, attach, it is a major portion of the gum. So what do you think will be its function? It has to provide additional support for the teeth and it will protect the underlying alveolar bone. So these are the two major functions of lamina propria or the connective tissue of gingiva, which is making the bulk of your gingiva. Now, the layers of connective tissue or the layers of lamina propria. So we have the superficial papillary layer, which is subjacent to the, subadjacent to the epithelium, which consists of, as the name suggests, papillary projections between the epithelial retapex. Now, all this you have learned in uh, histology. Okay, which you have already covered in your oral path. What are at apex, you know? So we have the superficial pap papillary layer, which is subadjacent to the epithelium, which consists of papillary projections between the epithelial right apex. And it has a density, a densi density of about 120 plus or minus 30 millimeter square gingival surface. Then we have, so superficial is your papillary layer. And now we have a deeper layer, which is a reticular layer. Contiguous with the periosteum, it's continuous with the periosteum, the adjacent bone. Term reticular means what? Net like. Okay, it's a net like and refers to arrangement of the collagen fibers. So, collagen fibers are arranged in a net like fashion. Okay, so these are the layers of lamina. We have a superficial papillary layer and we have a deeper reticular layer. Now, now, what is this bulk? Like uh, already we mentioned that connective tissue makes up major portions like your free gingiva, interdental, attached gingiva, both oral and facial aspects. Now, what are the components of this connective tissue? What is making that bulk? Okay, which is what is that that is embedded in the ground substance? This connective tissue can be also called as ground substance. So we have both cellular and extracellular things that are making up that uh, connective tissue. Cellular almost 8% by volume. Okay. Now the cellular elements, as the name suggests, cell. So the major cell which is involved in this are the fibroblasts. Okay. And the other cells. So major cell is fibroblast. What are the other cells? We have mast cells, tissue macrophages, adipose cells, the inflammatory cells. We have the PMNs, lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils. So the major portion of cells is your fibroblast and the other cells make up around 3%. Now this is the cellular side of it. Now what is the extracellular? Extracellular means the fibers. Okay. Fibers, which is mainly collagen, that is 60 to 90, 60 to 65% of fiber is your collagen fibers and the rest will be divided amongst the reticular and the elastin. Okay. And this extracellular is not just the fibers. You have the nerves, the vascular elements like the blood and the lymph and that is almost around 35 percent rest of the extracellular so 60 to 65 percent of the extracellular is by fibers specifically your collagen sorry collagen fibers and the reticular elastin and the 35 percent is made up of nerves and vascular elements in case of cellular you have the most important cell which is a fibroblast and the rest of the other cells which make up around three percent of the cellular component Okay, now let's move that into detail. So it's good if you have a ground picture of what you're going to do now. Now we'll start with the fibers. Let's start with the extracellular components. Okay, so collagen. Now we said that almost 60 to 6, according to this, we said 60 to 65 is made up of collagen, right? Now let's have a brief or a summary of what collagen is. The collagen fibers predominate in the gingival connective tissue and they constitute the most essential components of the periosteum. Now, let's have a basic synthesis and composition idea of collagen fibers. What do they do? Now, here we're going to talk, talk about a single collagen fiber, which is the tropocollagen. This is the smallest unit of the collagen molecule. 
okay consists of three polypeptide chains intertwined to form about 1000 amino acids glycine 20 percent proline a hydroxyproline and only in collagen taken as a measure of collagen content and these collagen fibers they are bundles of collagen fibrils what are collagen fibers they are bundles of collagen fibrils aligned in such a way that the fibers also exhibit a cross banding with a periodicity of 700 Armstrong at sites where a join with an overlapping by about 25% of their length. It's difficult to understand, but uh, it'll be easier if you uh, draw this picture. So we have the fibroblasts, the tropocollagen, the photofibers, which are moving as collagen fibers. And when these collagen fibers, they bundle themselves or they align in such a way that the fibers also exhibit a cross banding. And when they cross band, it is called as collagen fibers. Okay. As the collagen fibers mature, as the collagen fibers mature, covalent crosslinks, like I told you, these collagen fibers will crosslink with each other, right? To form the, uh, uh, sorry, fibrils will uh, form the fibers. So here, covalent crosslinks are formed between the tropocollagen molecules, resulting in an age-related reduction in collagen solubility. So what happens is when these collagens, uh, those who are mature enough and it doesn't get removed, so the, the left out collagen fibers, they will start accumulating. How they start accumulating? They will form cross-link with each other, okay? They're formed between the, 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 the tropocollagens will start cross-linking to each other and they become into a heavy molecule. And that heavy molecule will become, it will be very difficult for it to, you know, uh, dissolve, right? So it results in an age-related reduction in collagen solubility. Then what happens is the cementoblast and the osteoblast are cells which also possess the ability to produce collagen. So which are the two cells? Cementoblast and osteoblast along with fibroblast. So they are the ones who actually possess the ability to produce a collagen. Now there are types of collagen. We have type 1, type 3, type 4, type 5 and type 6. Okay. But most importantly you need to know type 1. But you can go through this. So they form the bulk. Type 1 collagen forms a bulk of the lamina propria. Okay, so mainly it's type 1, preferentially organized into denser fibrils, heavier fibrils, and they provide the tensile strength of the gingival tissue. Three, I'm just going through, I'm just going to read through, appears to be localized mostly as thinner fibers. The other one is more denser fibrils. Type 1, this is more thinner distributed in the reticular pattern near the basement membrane adjacent to the epithelial junction. Okay. Type 4, they are agrophilic reticulum fiber or branches between the collagen type 1 bundles. So between the type 1 bundles, they branch out. Continuous with fibers of the base membrane and the blood vessel wall. Type 5, they differ from the skin type by absence of 3-hydroxyproline. They account for less than 1% of total collagen and healthy gingiva. So they are the least found and distributes throughout the tissues in a parallel filamentous pattern. It appears to coat denser, denser fibers of type 1 and type 3. And type 6, beaded fiber forming collagen present as diffuse microfibers throughout the lamina propria. Also present near the basement membrane, around the blood vessels, and near the epithelial basement membrane and nerves. Okay? So, so what did we learn about? We learned about the synthesis, the composition of collagen. How does a tropocollagen look? Okay, what is its composition? And then we said that most of them can interlink with each other, crosslink with each other, and they become less soluble. That is, they become over mature. And fibroblasts, along with cementoblasts and osteoblasts, are cells which also have the ability to produce their collagen. And there are five types. We have type one collagen, type three, type four, type five, and type six of which type one make the bulk of the lamina propria. Okay, they have more denser fibrils and they provide the tensile strength of the gingival tissue tissue. Now, so we finished with the, I'll just uh, switch off the video so that I can con uh, concentrate. Okay, so we finished with the principal type fiber, which is your collagen. Now coming to the five, Fiber bundle groups, okay? Now we have gingival fiber groups, uh, which are five major principal fiber and six minor groups we have. 
So this, like this fiber groups, you will find in PDL as well. So I'll be taking your next class on PDL. So like PDL, gingiva also has got five major principal fiber bundles and six minor groups. Now, what are these principal fiber groups? They originate from the root cementum. Okay, they come from the cementum and spray out into the connective tissue compartment, forming a highly organized construct. And what do the, this is the, uh, this, these are the principal fiber groups. Those are the five major principal groups. So they originate from the root cementum and they spray out into the connective tissue compartment, forming a highly organized construct. What do the secondary fiber groups do? They cause more or less horizontally within the gingiva itself and between and around the individual tooth. The other one is starting originating from the root cementum and they come into your connective tissue compartment, okay? Whereas the minor fiber groups, they are more or less inside or within the gingiva itself. They align themselves horizontally within the gingiva and between and around individual teeth. The gingiva fiber architecture is not only composed of strong major elements, but these elements, they also provide support for each other as well. Thus, the various fiber groups of the gingival ligament are highly interdependent. So understand the five major five, uh, principal fiber groups and the six minor groups, they are, they provide support for each other as well. So they are highly interdependent. Now, coming to the, let's talk about the five major principal groups, okay? So I've made a table where you can copy this down. It will be easier to make a sheet. Okay, to write a, you know, a short notes on these. So first group we're going to talk about is dento gingival. We have a sub A, a subgroup, B subgroup, and C subgroup. Okay, now where are they coming from? As mentioned before, from the cementum, they splay directly laterally into the lamina propria or the connective tissue. Okay, now turns coronally, obliquely into the free gingival margin. They curve laterally, that is A group. B group curves laterally into the attached gingiva and a pital most segment of the free gingival margin. It's better if you write these uh, origin and orientation with the help of a diagram. And C group turns apically from the cementum. Okay, this is the A group and this is the B group. Other one is turning from the cementum near the CEJ, appearing to sweep down and across the crest of the alveolar bone and into the attached gingiva. And some elements may actually insert into the osseous alveolar crest. Commel with the commel with the dentoperiosteal fiber bundle. And what do you think is a function? Provide gingival support. They provide for the junctional epithelium and the IDP, interdental uh, gingiva. So this is the first major principle group, which is dentogingival. Now, the second major principal group or principal uh, fiber group or gingival fiber group is alveolar gingival. As the name suggests, alveolar and gingival. So the origin and orientation is from the periosteum of the alveolar crest. As the first name is alveolar, so it's coming from the periosteum of the alveolar crest. They will split coronally into the substance of the attached gingival. Okay, terminating in the free gingival margin facially and lingually and in the interdental papillae mesially and distant. Function attached gingiva to the bone. So it's coming from the periosteum into the attached gingiva. Okay, so the attached gingiva to the bone. Second, dentoperiosteum. So from the cementum, dento from the cementum near the cemento enamel junction, a pical to the dento gingival fiber. They traverse a relatively short distance to insert into the crest of the alveolar process and into the lateral aspect of the cortical plate. And some of the dentoperiosteal fibers may also insert into the muscles of the oral vestibule on the sublingual sulcus. You don't need to write that. You can just write the first uh, two, two sentences. Now, what is the function of dentoperiosteal? They anchor the tooth to the bone. So this is coming from cementum. Okay, and into the periosteum. So anchor the tooth to the bone and they protect the periodontal ligament of the PDL. So we finished with dentogingival, alveologingival, and dentoperiosteal. Fourth, circular fibers. 
okay they appear to be smaller in diameter than the other principal components of the gingival ligaments now where, what is the origin of that within the free gingival margin sorry free marginal and the attached gingiva coronal to alveolar crest they encircle each tooth near the crevice and they do not attach to any calcified structure okay what do they do what are the functions they maintain the contour and position of the free gingival free gingiva or the free marginal gingiva okay that is the function of circular circular is around the tooth itself now the last one which is transeptal transeptal means uh, where is its origin from the interproximal cementum coronal to alveolar crest they cause mesially and distally in the interdental area into cementum adjacent to so they are basically interdental their position is interdental between two teeth so they basically transeptal fibers are basically responsible for keeping the tooth in position because it keeps the these are the fibers which are surrounding each tooth okay what is the function as i said maintain relationships of the adjacent teeth adjacent teeth relationship protect the interproximal bone and they provide support for the interdental gingiva so it is in the interdental gingiva area it's in the interdental area so it keeps the tooth in in relationship and it protects the interproximal bone so these are the five major principal groups now we come to the secondary groups which are six we have the perios periosteal gingiva which is from the periosteum of the lateral aspect of alveolar process and they spill into the attached gingiva function attached gingiva attach the gingiva to the bone and they provide support and tone within the attached gingiva that is apical to the underlying alveolar crest region then we have the interpapillary they run in a buccolingual direction through the interdental tissue located within the substance of the coronal to the transeptal fiber groups idp coronal to the transeptal groups they provide support for the interdental gingiva semicircular they run in a semicircular manner as the name suggests around the teeth okay that is from the cementum on the mesial surface of the tooth the insert on the cementum the distal surface of same tooth located coronal to the transeptal fibers at approximately the same height as the circular fibers they support the free margin marginal gingiva transgingival they arise in the cementum and splay through the interdental septum eventually coalesce with the semicircular fibers of the adjacent tooth cores around the dental arch winding in a serpentine fashion like a snake in and out in and out between the tooth coronal to the cemento enamel junction what what is what are their functions they maintain the tissue consistency they provide additional support for the marginal gingiva and they secure the alignment of teeth in the arch intercircular they originate from cementum on the distal surface of a tooth splaying buccally and lingually around the adjacent tooth and inserting on mesial cementum of the next tooth they stabilize the teeth in the arch inter intergingival that is within the attached gingiva immediately subsisting to the epithelial basal membrane they cause mesial distally like the circular group but they do not insert into any calcified structure just like the circular fibers and they provide support and contour of the attached gingiva so so just now we mentioned the five major principal groups or principal gingival fibers and the minor gingival fiber groups it's better you as a given you that uh, schematic diagram with all the points please write it down in the paper so it will be easy for you to memorize okay now since we finished with the gingival fibers now what is the function of the gingival ligament complex as such why do we need the uh, gingival fibers so we have already mentioned most of these fibers have their own uh, functions so when you collaborate them this is what we get they attach the gingiva to the teeth and bone right they provide a dense framework that is bulk huh? that accounts for them because you need the gum to be rigid and they need to they, we need that resistance right to biomechanical forces we need the gum to have some resistance to oral forces so they provide a dense framework they attach the gingiva to the teeth and the bone they provide tone and resistance for the free gingival margin they provide the contour a proper shape and support to the attached gingiva 
Jinjai was able to withstand the frictional forces or the mastication forces and the pressures that result from mastication. They contribute to tooth position. As I told you, transeptal fibers, they are basically responsible for keeping the tooth in the arch or the relation, maintaining the relation between the adjacent tooth, right? So they contribute to the position of the tooth and biostability of these gingival tissues. They protect the very sophisticated cellular defenses located at the dentogingival interface. And they serve as a shield. Basically, they cover, they protect the pedial from any kind of insult. Because pedial gets traumatic, the tooth is loose. Okay, so the pedial, it shields the pedial from any kind of insult. So as in, to summarize all those functions of all those uh, major fibers and minor fibers, I have made a small note on what are the functions of gingival ligament complexes. So you summarize it and this is what you get. Okay. Now, now what is, so we finished with the uh, fibers. Okay. Now what is in the metrics? What do you find in the uh, metrics? The medium in which the connective tissue cells are embedded. That is called the metrics. Metrics of gingival connective tissue means it is the medium where the cells are embedded. So we finish with the fibers. Now we go to what is the principal cell type? I told you this fibroblast. And the rest of the cells were the macrophages, the monocytes, the Merkel cells and plasma cells. Okay, the rest of all those cells will come under the minor cells. So the major cell is fibroblast. So the medium where this connective tissue cells are embedded, they, that is called as a matrix. Okay, now what are they essential for? We need them for maintenance of normal functions of the connective tissue okay they are needed for transportation of water electrolytes nutrients or metabolites to and fro from the cells they need to grow right so they need all these important elements they there should be normal functioning of the connective tissue there should be transportation of water electrolytes nutrients and metabolites to and fro from the cells so this is maintained by the metrics or by the tissue cells which are embedded in the gingival connective tissue. Okay, so these cells produce mainly by the fibroblast and some constituents by mast cells and other components are derived from the blood. Tractional forces in the extracellular matrix produced by fibroblast are believed to be the forces responsible for generating tension in the collagen. And this keeps the teeth tightly bound to each other and to the alveolar bone. Now the matrix is made up of, or you, um, you can see the ground substance. The ground substance in that matrix is, you have glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycan. Or glycosaminoglycans in short is also called as GAGs or GAGs. So the GAGs in the gingival connective tissue include dermatin sulfate, so along with the cells, you also have the uh, glycosaminoglycans and the proteoglycans, okay? Dermatin sulfate, which is a predominant gag, that is 60% of rotal gag, appears to be localized, closely associated with the collagen fiber, and is particularly evident at the epithelial connective tissue interface. This is the most common one of it. 60% of total gag is dermatin sulfate. Then chondroitin 4-sulfate, second most common gag, 28%. Heparin sulfate, which is 5%, predominant gag in the gingival epithelium, uh, and hyaluronic acid, which is only 5%. Okay, so these are the uh, types of gags or the glycosaminoglycans, which make up the ground substance. And proteoglycans, right? Only ground substances, both gags and proteoglycans. The proteoglycans, they regulate the diffusion and the fluid flow through the matrix. They act as a molecular filter. So they basically, what is their function? They regulate diffusion and the fluid flow through the matrix of the gingival connective tissue. They are important determinants for the fluid content of the tissue and they may and they maintain the osmotic pressure, which is important because we need the electrolytes coming and going out, right? Sodium and potassium. So they maintain the osmotic pressure and they play an important role in the regulation of cell migration in the tissue. Okay, so major functions of proteoglycans, they regulate diffusion and fluid flow. They maintain the osmotic pressure and also the fluid content of the tissue and they play an important role in regulation of cell migration in the tissue. Now, these are the various types of proteoglycans as I've just put for your uh, information. We have proteoglycans type versicin, 
Decorin, Biglican, Sindican, CV44, and Perlican. I'm not going into detail about these, but this is just where you can write it down if, for your information. Okay, now we'll come. So uh, we just talked about the cells and the ground substance. Cells, we said fibroblasts make up the major cell and the rest of the cells like mast cells and eosinophils, macrophages, inflammatory cells like neutrophils, plasma cells, and lymphocytes. Okay, these are the uh, these are the minor cells which are present and the major cells are fibroblasts. And we said the ground substance or the matrix of the connective tissue is made up of all these. The matrix of the connective tissue is made up of cells like fibroblast and the minor cells like all that I've mentioned, like your lymphocytes, your monocytes, macrophages, plasma cells, hmm? neutrophils, uh, eosinophils, uh, and uh, lymphocytes. Okay, And it is also made up of proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans or GATs. Now coming into detail. Now let's move into detail about, so we finished with the fibers. Okay, microscopic feature we finished of the connective tissue. We, uh, connective tissue has got major fibers. Like I uh, we already mentioned about the five major principal fiber groups and the six minor groups. Then we mentioned about the cells, fibroblast and the less uh, important, uh, not important, less bulk of the cells and we mentioned the ground substance. Now let's come into detail about the cells. The periodontium is a dynamic structure that responds continually to the stresses and insults brought to bear upon its component tissue. The cells normally present in the soft connective tissue of the periodontium reflects this dynamism. Now major cell type 65 percent that is the most prominent connective tissue cells of the total cell population are your fibroblast. They are of mesenchymal origin. What is the structure? Now we're going to talk about all these cells. Okay, now we're coming to the major cell type, which is the fibroblast. They are consistent with their high level of synthetic activity. What, what, what do their shape look like? Spindle shaped or stellate cell with an oval shaped nucleus. Okay, the spindle shape with the spindle shaped uh, oval shaped nucleus containing one or one more nucleoli. The cytoplasm contains a well-developed rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex of considerable size, large and numerous mitochondria, many fine tonofilaments, a large number of vesicles adjacent to the cell membrane all along the periphery of the cell, and numerous vacuoles. Function. They synthesize, they maintain the prominence of the extracellular matrix of the connective tissue. Basically, production of various types of fibers, such as a collagen, which is a major, elastin, which is less major, found in the connective tissue. So they are responsible for the production of the type 1 collagen. I already mentioned type 1 collagen is produced by fibroblast. Synthesis of the connective tissue matrix, like your ground substance, which are the glycoproteins and the glycosaminoglycans, and they regulate the collagen degradation also. We need all these collagen to move away, right? The old collagen has to uh, dissolve and go and the new collagen has to come. So they are also responsible, the fibroblasts are also, they are also responsible for the regulation of the collagen degradation through phagocytosis and secretion of collagenases. So major cell type was fibroblast. Now we just went through the structure, what is your main function? 65% we talked about their structure and their function. Now coming to the less dominant cells, which are the mast cells. They are often located near the vascular elements, okay, very close to the vascular element structure, round or oval cell with electron dense basophilic granules that stain metachromatically and contain proteolytic enzymes such as histamine, heparin, which are known to elicit inflammation, right? Well developed Golgi complex, very scarce rough endoplasmic reticulum, and a large number of microvilli along the periphery function identified by the unique cytoplasmic granule which produce heparin histamine so they react when there is some kind of allergy right mostly with the hypersensitivity they elicit it they are known to elicit inflammation so that is their main function muscles are released during inflammation macrophages now we know what a macrophage is good at right phagocytosis so fixed macrophages and histiocytes they are com as components of mononuclear phagocyte system so macrophages are components of mononucleoside phagocyte system that is res 
they derive from the blood monocytes derived from monocytes particularly numerous in the inflamed tissue their function is major function is scavenging the primary role in disease tissue is one of scavenger right you need to remove the uh, old tissues or the old cells so the primary role in disease tissue is one of scavenger dispensing with the bacteria they remove the bacteria they remove the debris and the toxic substances and they're capable of synthesizing and secreting powerful hydrolytic enzyme so that's a major function of macrophages one is a scavenging action where they remove the bacteria debris and the toxic substance through the mononuclear phagocyte system and they are also capable of synthesizing and secreting powerful hydrolytic enzymes now the inflammatory cells which are the inflammatory cells we have the neutrophil plasma cells and lymphocytes now all these types of blood vessels are present all types of blood cells are present the great majority of them within the periodontal vasculature these cells are also seen within the lamina propria among the collagenous elements usually perivascular and full range of leukocytic cells are observed neutrophil neutrophilic granulocytes or the polymorphonucleosides they have pmns they have a lobulate nucleus and they have numerous lysosomes containing enzymes in the cytoplasm although they are rarely observed within the substance of healthy gingival connective tissue they frequently emigrate from subepithelial vascular plexus to enter and try uh, transmigrate the junctional epithelium probably directed by substances deriving from the plaque microorganisms which are chemotactic for pmns the neutrophils thus represent the host defense mechanism so their major involvement is in the host defense mechanisms that is deployed precisely at the front line in the periodontium whenever there is an inflammation they come into action okay function or lee mentioned capable of moving towards any offensive micro microorganisms and they engulf them with subsequent killing by intracellular enzymes those are the lysozymes they have lysozymes right so they kill the intracellular enzymes no they kill the bacteria with their intracellular enzymes they destroy the toxic substances in the gingiva such as the necrotic tissue or the immune complexes they participate in destroying host tissue through the action of the collagenase acid hydrolysis and neutral uh, and the neutral proteases that can break down the collagen and other components of the connective tissue due to the omnipresence of neutrophils in the gingival tissue it is likely that even in health they play a role in periodontal homeostasis so they play both roles in health and in disease they play a role in periodontal homeostasis and we are talking about neutrophils lymphocytes structure characterized by an oval to spherical nucleus containing localized areas of electron dense chromatin the narrow border of cytoplasm surrounding the nucleus contains numerous free ribosomes a few mitochondria endoplasmic reticulum with fixed ribosomes in localized areas and lysosomes function major effector cells of acquired or cellular immunity okay so they are the major cells of acquired or cellular immunity directed against a specific antigen acquired by the host after a prior infection by a bacterium or other foreign substances again lymphocytes are of two major types which are t cells and b cells okay plasma cells this is the last of the inflammatory cells usually observed perivascular or close to the boundary between the connective tissue compartment and the junctional epithelium functions are believe to participate in the host response again same thing any insult borne by the periodontal tissue or on a continuous basis throughout the life okay they contribute to homeostasis just like neutrophils they are primed to participate in inflammatory response in their inflammatory cells those so they participate in inflammatory response in healthy connective tissue through their function is still though their function is still obscure the abundance of endoplasmic reticulum signifies their ability to synthesize immunoglobulins hmm, igg's it is likely that they are primed to respond to an appropriate antigen signal okay so we finished with the gingival connective tissue right we talked about the fibers we talked about the the five major fibers and the six minor fibers and we talked about the cells which are fibroblasts which are the major cells and then we talked about the mast cells uh, eosinophils macrophages 
and the inflammatory cells such as neutrophils, plasma cells, and lymphocytes. And we also know about the ground substance. We talked about the glycosaminoglycans and the proteoglycans. Now coming to what are the functions of this gel? Now these all these fibers and cells and ground substance, they make up the connective tissue. Now, what is the function of this gingival connective tissue? Primarily, they protect the root surface and alveolar bone from the external or environment. They aid in the support and fixation of teeth within the alveolar housing and they provide adequate support for the epithelial tissues. Now, we need to go to the blood supply. This is the blood supply of the entire gingival we're talking about. Okay, now what are the sources of blood supply to gingiva? We have the supraperiosteal arteriole, which is along the facial and the lingual surfaces of the alveolar bone, from which the capillaries extend along the sulcular epithelium and retapex of external gingival surfaces. These are the supraperiosteal arterioles. Then we have the vessels of PDA here. They extend into the gingiva and anastomose with the capillaries in sulcus area. Then arterioles. They emerge from the crest of interdental septa. They extend parallel to crest of the bone to anastomose with the vessels of PDL, capillaries in the sulcus, and vessels that run over the alveolar crest. So they make, they make these uh, three make up the major blood supply to the gingiva. We have the supraperiosteal arterioles, the vessels of the PDL or the periodontal ligament, and the arterioles. And we also find two more things. So within the gingival lamina propria or the connective tissue, terminal blood vessels, they form two networks, which are underneath the oral gingival epithelium. And both these networks, they exist prior to tooth eruption. So it is before tooth eruption, these two plexus can be seen. So along with the rest of the blood vessels, these two also contribute. That is a sub-epithelial plexus, which is immediately beneath the oral epithelium of the free and attached gingiva. And then we have the dendrogingival plexus. So subepithelial plexus and dendrogingival plexus, which is beneath the junctional epithelium. So three major vascular blood supply is coming from three major places. We have the supraperiosteal arteriole, the vessels of PDL, and the arterioles. And minor, we have the subepithelial plexus and the dendrogingival plexus. So all five should be mentioned if the blood supply of gingiva is asked. Okay. Innervation. Now, where is a nerve supply? Mostly myelated nerve supplies. They're closely associated with the blood supply, blood vessels. They're derived from fibers arising from the nerves in the PDL and from the labial, buccal, and palatal nerves. Nerve structures in the connective tissue. What are the? Uh, there are four major nerve structures in the connective tissue. We have the meshwork of terminal agrophilic fibers, which some extend into the epithelium. The masonite type tactile corpuscles, the cross type N bulbs or the temperature for temperature and encapsulated spindles. So they are the various regions of gingiva are innervated. Okay, the various regions of gingiva are innervated by N branches of trigeminal nerve. So basically, it is innervated by the N branches of trigeminal nerve. But these are the four nerve structures in the connective tissue. Meshwork, masona type tactile corpuses, cross type end bulbs, and encapsulated spindles. So just learn as it is written. Now coming to the last portion, which is the clinical features of healthy gingiva. Now we need to know this because we need to differentiate between a healthy periodontium and a diseased periodontium. So when you finally come into your clinics, you will start, uh, uh, you know, you will start learning about different diseases and how to recognize them or how to clinically differentiate between the diseases and the conditions of the gingiva. So for that, you need to know the normal clinical features or normal uh, parts, normal uh, features of gingiva. Okay. Color. What do you think is the exact color of gingiva? The actual color of gingiva is called coral pink. It's termed as coral pink. And this coral pink is produced by, why does the color come? Because of the vascular supply, the thickness of the epithelium, the degree of keratinization, and the presence of pigment-containing cells. Okay, so these are the reasons for the coral pink color. The color varies among different persons, and it appears to be correlated with the cutaneous pigmentation. Now, there is something called physiological pigmentation, or you must have already learned about melanin pigmentation. 
So it's nothing to be worried. It's not pathology. It is not pathological. It is physiological pigmentation, which is caused by overproduction of melanin. So melanin occurs as a diffuse, deep, purplish discoloration or as irregularly shaped brown and light brown patches. So when you come into clinics, you will start viewing your uh, patients and you will know what this melanin pigmentation looks like. They may appear in the gingiva as early as three hours after birth and they often is the only evidence of pigmentation. Okay, so color is coral pink. Size. What is the size? What do you mean by size? So it corresponds to the sum total of the bulk of the cellular and the intercellular elements and their vascular supply. So just now I told you about the components of the connective tissue. What did we say? We have the cellular elements and the extracellular. So those and the vascular supply together make the bulk, which is a sum total. That is your size. An alteration in size is a common feature of gingival disease. The first thing you will notice when there is a diseased periodontium is the enlargement or there will be an hyperplasia of cells. Hyperplasia means increase, okay, increase in number or size. So this is the first thing that you will notice, alteration in size. Contour, contour is the shape. So contour of the gingiva, it will vary considerably and it depends on this is again physiological because it could it could depend on the shape of the tooth. So some children might have a backward facing, backward pushed teeth or a forward inclined teeth. So in that case, a contour of gingiva will vary, right? You won't have a scalloped contour. So the shape of the teeth can considerably change the contour of the gingiva or the alignment of the tooth in the arch can also change the contour. Or the location and size of the area of the proximal contact between the teeth and dimensions of the facial and lingual gingival abrasions. They can all lead to a uh, you know, varying contour of the gingiva. So these all make up the contour. They are all responsible for the contour and they can also cause the difference in contour. Okay, so variations in contour can come as scalloped outline on the facial and lingual surfaces. Teeth with a relatively flat surface. So it'll have a straight line. Teeth with a pronounced mesodistal convexity or a labial version. The normal accurate contour is accentuated. So these are the conditions where the contour can be a little different. Teeth in lingual version. As I told you, backward teeth, forwardly, uh, forwardly inclined teeth, backward inclined teeth, right? So they're all the, uh, the, there can be variations contour. And in inflammatory conditions, like Stillman's clefts and McCall's testules. Shape. Shape of interdental gingiva governed by two things. The contour is important. Contour of the proximal tooth surface and the location and shape of the gingival embrasure. So these two are the ones which are contributing to the shape of the gum or the gingiva. When the proximal sur surfaces of the crowns are relatively flat or facial-lingually flat, the interdental gingiva becomes narrow, mesiodistant. So you have a narrow shape. Conversely, with the proximal surfaces that flare away from the area of contact, or the interdental gingiva is broad, mesiodistal. So either, either it could be flat, facial-lingually, or it could be broad, mesiodistally, according to the position of the tooth. The height of the interdental gingiva will vary with the location of the proximal contact. That could be either a pyri pyramidal interdental position in anterior region of dentition or the flattened IDP, which is buccolingually in the molar region. So shape is again uh, determined by the, these two things, the contour of the proximal tooth surface and the location and the shape of the gingival margin. Consistency. Gingiva is usually firm, resilient, and with the exception of the mobile free margin, they're tightly bound to the underlying bone, except the marginal gingiva. Attached gingiva, interline gingiva should be tightly bound to the uh, underlying bone. What do you mean by firm? Firm is that it should be hard, right? It should not be edematous, it should not be fluffy. And resilient is when you when you uh, you know you uh, you make a you can use a probe a diagnostic probe and you press it on the gingiva you can find that it will come back hmm? it's like a catapult you send a catapult you push the catapult behind and it goes back right so just like that resiliency is when the gingiva is pushed and it fights back to come back that is called a resilient nature so the gingiva should be firm and resilient. 
the collagenous nature of the lamina propria or the collagenous nature of the connective tissue and its continuity with the mucoperiosteum of the alveolar bone, they determine the firmness of the entire gingiva. The gingival fibers also contribute to the firmness. As I already told you, the fibers make up the bulk, right? So they are also responsible for the firmness of the gingival margin. So basically it should be firm and resilient. Surface texture. The gingiva presents a textured surface similar to an orange peel and is referred to as being stippled. Okay. And uh, so there is, uh, when, you come, when you come into clinics, you'll know that most of your examiners will ask you to look for stippling. And how do, we, how do we do that? What is stippling? It's actually an orange peel appearance of the gingiva. Or you can even call it as protuberance, depressions and protuberance. Okay. And how do we view that? Basically by drying the gingiva. First you take a cotton piece, dry the gingiva with the cotton piece, the attached and this orange peel appearance will be seen. Okay, when you dry the gingiva with the cotton, you can see this orange peel or you can see this depression like craters, like a crater in the moon. Okay, craters on the moon. You can find this orange peel or this depressions and protuberances on the attached gingiva. And this is particularly seen only in the attached, the attached gingiva and the central portion of internal gingiva. Interdental gingiva stipple. You cannot see it in the free gingival margin. You will never find it in the marginal gingiva. You can find it in the central portion of inter interdental gingiva and the attached gingiva. So this is viewed by drying the gingiva with a piece of cotton and you can find that orange peel. And this is called, that feature is called stippling. Okay, so you can say the gingiva is stippled. The pattern extent of stippling varies among individuals and different areas of the same mouth being less prominent on the lingual than in facial. So it is less in the lingual side. Mostly you will find the anteriors or the facial, facial areas. And they vary with age. It is absent when you're, a, when you're infant. Absent in infancy. It appears in some children at about five years of age. It increases until adulthood and then quickly disappears in old age. So these are the stippling how it varies with age okay surface texture so here you need to know orange peel appearance and this is called as stipple and how do we check we use a cotton we dry the gums dry the gingiva and you find this orange peel appearance or protuberance is a depression like craters and this is found only in the attached gingiva and central portion of the interdental gingiva not in the marginal gingiva and this will vary with age so this is a very common viva question which is asked so you need to note it down Okay, surface texture again is the same thing. Stippling is a form of adaptive specialization or reinforcement for function. So what does it do? It is a feature. You can say that stippling, with all your might, you can say it's a feature of healthy gingiva. If stippling is present, it is a feature of healthy gingiva. There is reduction or loss in gingival disease. So if there is a, if it is a disease gingiva and the stippling reappears, that means the gingiva is getting better, right? and returns when the gingiva is restored to health. So basically it is a feature of healthy gingiva. Position. The position of gingiva refers to the level at which the gingival margin is attached to the tooth. Okay, gingival margin, the free gingiva. It, so this position of gingiva will refer to that level where the gingival margin is attached. Continuous tooth eruption. That is eruption continues throughout life and it has got two phases. We have the active eruption, passive eruption. In active eruption, the movement of teeth in direction of the occlusal plane, upwards. Passive eruption, exposure of teeth by apical migration of gingiva. Okay, and this concept will distinguish between anatomic crown, which is the portion of tooth which is covered by enamel, anatomic root, portion of tooth covered by cement. Clinical crown, which is part of the tooth that has been denuded of its gingiva and projects into the oral cavity. And the clinical root, which is a portion of tooth covered by periodontal tissue. So you just need to know position of gingiva refers to the level at which the gingival margin is attached to the tooth. So we are done with the uh, gingiva acid. We have learned about uh, just now I covered the connective tissue interface, epithelial connective tissue interface, which had all the junctional complexes and the four elements. We talked about the gap junctions, the tight junctions, and the communicating junctions, right? Cell to cell, cell to matrix. Then we talked about uh, connective tissue as such.
penetration is made up of extracellular and cellular elements. Cellular elements, we have the cells, right? And the major cell was fibroblast. And we talked about its functions and also the uh, uh, the uh, other cells like the mast cells, the plasma cells, the, uh, the lymphocytes, the neutrophils, and the monocytes and the macrophages. So these were all the cellular components. Then we have the extracellular components, which were the fibers. A major fiber was a collagen fiber, and then we also have the oxytocin and the elastin fibers, which were less in number. And then we talked about the vascular supply and the nerve innervations, the blood supply and the nerve innervations. Then, so they make up the whole of connective tissue. Now, after that, we talked about the clinical features of the gingiva, which is important because you need to see the difference in a diseased periodontium and a healthy periodontium. Now, coming to the final portion or final part of the uh, chapter, which is aging. How is aging and gingiva related? Okay, and gingiva recession related. It has been determined through studies that with age, the physiological apical migration of the epithelium can occur, isn't it? As you grow old, there will be apical migration of the epithelium. And this hypothesis also fits with the connective passive eruption theory by Gottlieb and Auburn in 1936. It is postulated that as age advances, there is a gradual physiological recession of the gingiva that occurs concomitantly with an apical migration of the epithelium. The recession of the gingiva is a result of occlusal migration of teeth, compensating for occlusal wear, and a stable location of the gingival margin. In other words, the gingiva cannot keep even pace with the migrating teeth, and consequently, recession will take place. So nothing is uh, it's not anything difficult. Basically, what they say is with age, there is a vital migration of the epithelium, because as the teeth moves apart, right, there will be spacing between the teeth, and then the consequent recession will take place. So this is how aging and recession is related. So as far as the location of mucogingival junction is concerned, no changes with advancing age has been observed. So there is no uh, difference between the mucogingival junction and the age as such. Furthermore, if no gingival recessions are present, it has been noted that the gingival width increases with age. The phenomenon that, in general, the degree of recession increases with age is well known. However, this is not necessarily the result of aging, since mechanical trauma, example, tooth brushing can also lead to a recession. So it's not that age should be the definitive cause for recession. It could be because of mechanical trauma like tooth brushing methods. Okay? The recession of gingiva has also been found after extrusion after the teeth comes down you know when there is antagonist teeth or the opposite teeth is not present what happens the upper teeth start moving down or the lower teeth start moving up so this could also be the reason for recession not just age so it may be concluded that with regard to migration insufficient evidence is available for a physiological apical migration of the junction epithelium due to aging so there is not much of proof so it seems probable that periodontal destruction will occur only by mechanical trauma in the presence of plaque and consequent inflammation of the periodontion. So you can say that there is no major proof saying that aging is responsible for recession. It could be because of tooth brushing methods, trauma, mechanical trauma. It could be because of spacing. It could be due to the extrusion of teeth. Okay. So uh, or even in the presence of plaque, uh, your oral hygiene issues and consequent inflammation of the periodontion. So as such, it's just a small part of your chapter. Uh, sometimes it can be asked as a question, but it's not being seen in your paper so far. So don't treat it with a lot of importance, but you can write a short note saying how is age and uh, if age and uh, uh, this recession is related or not, okay? So this is the final part. I know this is a bit of a dragging chapter, but if you put in a little bit of effort, it will be nice to learn. It's actually good and it's actually easy. Uh, just follow my notes and make notes as soon as possible before your Wednesday class. So it will be easy for you to follow on that day because it's a little bit of a vast chapter compared to the other parts of the periodontium, other tissues of the periodontium like PDL, cement, mandible, lemon, a little bit easier than gingiva. Gingiva, you need to put in a little more effort and try to make notes. That's the only way how to read gingiva. And I hope you have understood something. I'm not expecting too much, but something. And if you have any doubts, 
so far, please let me know on Wednesday when we take a class. Uh, I'll be free to answer your questions. Okay, and I hope you enjoyed this class. Thank you so much for your uh, concentration. Okay, thank you.